Today's is scary, um, so I've had to have more caffeine because if you thought I went fast yesterday, this is going to change your perspective on that a little bit. Um, so effectively, I do a lot of Linux and I do a lot of in infrastructure services to effectively, uh, or to support OS X clients. Now, I like it, it's lightweight, it's easy. After a while, once you wrap your head around it a bit and it's fast. Um, so. This is going to be the shortest slide deck you ever see. Um, maybe. It was at one slide, it's now three. Um, so we're just going to get underway to begin with. Um, first of all, has anyone used the NetSus appliance from Jamf? Yes? You understand it? Has anyone pulled it apart and actually had a look and seen how it really works? Um, cool. Right, so very briefly, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, it is uh, an Ubuntu Linux basic server with a web front end on it that lets you manage it to an extent. Um, so I'm just going to log straight onto it, and you'll see customer URLs. Um, so you get the idea. Um, this is freely available from GitHub if anyone wants to play with it. And you have a simple software update server which uses Reposado at the back end. It's got a web UI to manage it. It's a couple of features missing, but it's, it's not too bad. And it has a netboot server which effectively uses a forked build of the DHCP daemon from Linux to broadcast the boot service discovery protocol. It's also got some basic system configuration, user accounts, SSH logins, network config, all of those things. It's a good little tool, but like everything I play with, I just pulled it to pieces to see what I could do with it. And in fact, that shutdown interface, I think I wrote that for this project. Um, so anyway, that's the NetSus. It's good, but there might be other things you want to do. Um, it's a good example to have a look at Ubuntu, uh, sorry, Ubuntu with that because Ubuntu is the OS X of Linux. It's easy. But I've found in education, particularly in Australia, everyone uses Red Hat um, because Red Hat basically give it away to higher ed organizations. So that being said, there is a, another flavor of Linux called CentOS, which is a rebadged, recompiled version of Red Hat without support. So it's a good learning platform. Um, if you're doing production servers, I thoroughly recommend Red Hat and I thoroughly recommend purchasing the support for it because they're good. They're really good. Um, so basically what I'm doing here is I'm just going to sort of walk those of you who have never done it through the basic installation setup of a Linux server because it's not too difficult. It's nowhere near as ugly as it used to be. Um, so we find some installation media. Well, we get, got asked a few questions, and I'm just going to highlight a couple of gotchas that I find when you're doing this, particularly with the Red Hat variants. So language selection, it looks very much like any other OS installer. We've just got standard storage. We're going to discard all of the data on it. There's nothing there. Gotcha number one. You have to enable network first. So you just connect it automatically, and away you go. Uh, we are in Sydney today. Give it a root password. Yeah, whatever. Can anyone guess what that is? Daniel will know. He knows me too well. Um, got you number two. When you have a drive over 50 gig in Red Hat variants, it will automatically partition it and put the bulk of the data in the slash home directory. This might not be very useful for you unless you want to put everything in there as well. So I usually just delete that partition. Um, sometimes I create an additional mount point for it, but most of the time I just put it all in one bucket like we're all familiar with because we're OS X users. Um, yeah. So we're just going to format it, write our changes out to disk. Dum-de-dum-de-dum. And of course, it goes slow for the first time today when I'm on stage. <laughs> you are kidding me, right? All right. Because we don't have a lot of time, and I'm not going to. Oh, OK. 
when I threaten it with brute force, it, it goes away. Um, so our installation. This is the way I, I, you know, horses for courses. If you want a desktop to play with, I find it generates a lot of overhead, particularly on a headless server and data center. It's somewhat pointless. Um, I always go with the minimal installation and then add what I need afterward and then afterwards. And then you get what you need and only what you need to do the job you want to do. You can build very purpose-built servers, which perform a lot better. Um, so we check it, and it just kicks into install mode. Now, we're not going to wait for that, because it takes about 30 or 40 seconds. <laughs> and we don't have that to spare yet. <laughs> so we'll just skip forward. So we're at a pre-first boot stage. That is basically the screen comes up, says installation complete, reboot. That's where we are now. Um, so we're going to rip into this. Now, from here, we have a pretty dumb OS. Network's enabled. It's connected to DHCP. Um, this might be a problem if you're in a data center, so you'll have to log into a console and do a couple of things. Um, also, I'm cheating because I've been burnt by demos before. I've got my installation media attached. I'm going to do most of my installs from the DVD. Um, I'll explain what it is when I break down the commands so that I can do that. And I've also got most of the other stuff that's not in the installation media sitting on my local computer, and I'm just going to pull that in through a curl command. Um, so there'll be a bit of that, but the other thing we'll see in a moment is that I have all of the commands recorded and this will be freely available for everyone afterwards because there's a lot of them and there's a lot of typing, so I'm just going to copy and paste. Um, all right. Now, where are we at? So first thing I need to do is get my IP address, which is a simple command, and this is the only thing that won't be there, IP space ADDR. That's the supported thing in most versions of Linux that have got a 2.6 kernel and greater. You'll understand what that means once you start playing with it. Um, so we're living on 172.176, uh, sorry, 172.16.207.134. So nice. We know where we are. I can get my mouse back, release that to the wild, get a terminal, get a Big terminal so we can see what's going on. Now. First thing we're going to do is SSH into our Linux box. And second thing we're going to do is just uh, is remove my history. Because I already have an SSH key for it. It's got to go away. Right. Now, what do we need to do first? Maybe network configuration, assign it an IP, make it nice and easy. Um, we're going to need some things to do that. So, uh, actually, I'll do, I've got this slightly out of sequence. So there's a th the Red Hat code base and the package repositories are quite limited. Um, they're very, very specific about what they put in there and what they support. There is an additional repository out there. Um, and by the way, when I say repository, where all the software lives. Um, it's called Extra Packages for Ep Enterprise Linux, which is Apple. And there are things in there that I use. In particular, a, a thing called Netatalk, which provides AFP file services, which we're going to use today. So I just pull the Apple repo. Um, as you can see, I've got two URLs here. One's commented out. And the one I'm going to use is on my computer. The other one's somewhere out at Fedora. So we just simple install. Uh, the command to install things in Red Hat is yum. Man yum tells you how to use it, nice and easy. Uh, in fact, you can read through this and see all of the different weird and wonderful things I do with it as I'm doing it. Um, I need to create a mount point for my installation media. So we've got that up and going. And now I want to install a couple of useful tools. One of which is a network configuration tool, um, which I don't even know how to say that. Um, and the other is unzip, because a lot of things come down in zip format, and I need to unpack them. And I don't have either of those things yet. This is nice and easy, because we can configure our Ethernet interface, use DHCP, static IP, all of that sort of stuff. It's fairly straightforward. 
Um, we will just save and quit from that. So we're not really going to mess around with too much there. I just wanted to show you a useful tool rather than going in and editing the network config scripts directly because that is a pain in the ass. That is quick and easy. I appreciate that. Um, who here is sort of uses the command line a lot? Scripting, bash scripting? OK, sed. Everyone knows what sed is? OK, I am a sed junkie. I use it for everything so I don't have to go VI, open up, edit, paste, that sort of stuff. I am all sed all the time. Um, so all I've done is basically replace the host name in the, um, the system config network file with that command and then set it in memory. No bigs. Um, we can check those things by having a look at what they say. So I've actually just replaced it with centos, uh, centos.example.com. And my system should be reporting back an accurate host name now. So that's like doing you change host main commands in OS 10. The second thing I'm going to do, because I'm actually going to install something that is not friendly for firewalls on this, because it opens a lot of ports, TCP and UDP. So I am going to disable the firewall on this server. Um, if it's sitting in a data center and it's not internet facing, I really don't see the need to have it on. Um, it's on by default, and that system config network TUI, there's one that's uh, system config firewall TUI, which does the same job for the firewall, and you can map all of the ports and, and piss around for hours and hours and hours, and, and we're not going to do that. Um, so I'm having a look at all of my startup items here that are running, and we have IP6 tables and IP tables, so our IPv4 and our IPv6 Firewalls are different binaries on different service levels, so you've got to turn them both off if you want to turn them off. Um, Linux is very granular in case you hadn't noticed. Um, I'm just checking the service status of them, making sure that they're not going. So service name, is it doing something? Yes, no, maybe. Service name action is the basic syntax for all of that. Um, there's another thing called SE Linux. Anyone encountered this? Yeah, everyone turn it off usually. I've tried to write policies for it. It gets really complicated, um, and I hate doing that, so I try and avoid it. At the moment, I only ever set it to permissive mode, which basically means it allows you to do anything, but it tracks it. So if you're trying to write policies, you can record all of the logs and get the dumps out of it and then figure out how to do it, because it's documented like all Linux stuff. It makes your head want to explode. So we're just going to update the policy using sed. We're going to turn it off immediately. And I should be able to see that with the SE status command. And it now says we're all working in permissive mode. So it's not going to stop me from doing anything, which is good. Next thing I want to do is just create a local administrator account. Typically, I disable the root account afterwards and then use only this and escalate my privileges using sudo. Um, that's a fairly good syntax for any user account account creation. Um, your default groups, like we have admin and staff in OS 10, uh, ADM and users. Not really difficult, and you can create them wherever. The default location is the home directory for user homes. C is the human readable name. It's never usually referenced. And our short name is the last argument. Your login shell, you've sort of got to tell it everything all the time. We just want to set up the password, um, PA, uh, sorry, pass WD. And then the username is the standard command for doing this. And then you enter the password twice, and away you go. Um, of course, I'm using really short, stupid words. Um, and I'm granting it pseudo access. So we have everything going on there. And I've just got to update my, oh, sorry, the permissions on my pseudo as file, because they won't get honored, read, noticed, or anything done to them unless they're set correctly. So that's the actual correct octal mode for a pseudo as file. Now. That was a lot of stuff for just a user account. So we're almost finished a basic system setup, and we are uh, nine minutes in. This is going to get interesting. Um, I'm installing NTP date. Actually, I've already installed it. Great. Um, I'm going to turn the service on in a second. I've just set a time server so it can sync. Actually, no, I'm not going to turn the service on because it can cause network lags. And I'm doing a demo, and I don't trust network lags in a demo. Um, but it is simply turn it on using check config and enable the or like and then start the service. Right. That being done, we have an OS and a user account. Yay! Nothing difficult. Now, we're going to install some stuff and we're going to do things. Um, in fact, I will do this. Right, we are installing a package called Avahi. Avahi is bonjour for Linux, network service location. We're installing Apache, we're installing NFS utils, and we're installing the TFTP server. 
because we're going to use all of those. And then it installs a whole bunch of other stuff, as you can see, supporting things. It figures itself out, and away we go. So we know what our dependencies are. Now, I also need the Netatalk repository, oh, sorry, the Netatalk binaries, which come from Apple usually. Um, but because I'm going to do it locally with local media, same thing. It installs Perl and a couple of other bits and bobs in the background, so we're good to go. Now, this. So there are two Python forks out there of um, the boot service discovery protocol. Um, one of them's Pepines, and I don't know who the other guy is, but I use the other guys. And I do this because in a lot of environments, they're restrictive about installing additional third-party software on Red Hat servers that you know, like comes from Git and things like that. You have to go through all sorts of weird and wonderful approval processes. And Pepine's implementation is probably better um, but it's a, um, it has a dependency on a few things that you have to pull from Git, and it's got a couple of extra setups. So I found this other one out there that wasn't too bad, but it was a little bit buggy, and then I forked the code, which is sitting in my Git repository, which I think I've put on the last slide. Um, so free to download it, whatever. Um, the URL, the actual direct download URL is sitting here. Um, Basically, it does the same thing, but with all of the inbuilt system binaries. Um, the only thing it really doesn't handle well are binary plists in the NBIs, so you have to make sure they're in XML format. Um, so, that being said, tiny thing, less than a K in size. We'll just unpack it. And. I am just going to jump into the directory. So I've made this one pretty easy for everyone. It's got, it'll install on Ubuntu or Red Hat, no problem. Um, given that I don't want it to go off and download anything, I am just going to comment out the installs because I installed them beforehand. So I'm just editing the installation file. And now we should have, nice. I'll just clean up after myself. This is a, a good thing with Linux. Clean up after yourself, because you don't really want crap everywhere. The whole idea is to be lightweight. Now, what did that do? That configured uh, an AFP share. It configured the TFTP server. It configured the NFS server. It um, put a Python binary in user local. It put a conf file in place. It created a SharePoint on AFP. Basically, it did everything that you did with, that happens when you enable netboot in OS X server. So, now, um, if I'm right, I did. All right, I just coded the username and password in there because it's quicker and I don't like typing that much. We have a netboot SharePoint. Now, over here, we have an OS X server. Oh, sorry, an OS X client, I should say, which is slowly coming up. And we'll open up system prefs. Now, those of you who've used the NetSUS will remember the pain of uploading the netboot, refreshing the page, enabling the image, one image at a time. Yeah, I didn't like that. So I did this. Um, if we give this a few seconds. Oh, there we have it. There's a net restore. Just like that. I want a netboot. I think the refresh rate's every nine seconds or something like that on the sysprof pane. This should come up very shortly. Wait, I'm not done. I can just keep going until the end of time. I don't know how many it'll take. But that is basically a zero config netboot server. Um, built in Linux. You build the whole thing, you've got a SharePoint, connect to the SharePoint, throw them in there, broadcast them straight away. No messing around with settings, no changing things, nothing. This is easy. I don't like restoring images, so I'm going to delete that. The problem is to make them go away in system preferences, and this happens with OS 10 too, you have to refresh the pane in its entirety, but you just delete them if you don't want them anymore. So that sort of thing makes life fairly easy. Do we have any questions? Yeah, that broadcasts across subnets. But you still need to have your IP helpers. It does exactly what OS 10 server does. Um, all right, we don't need that anymore. 
So that's good. We've got a netboot server. So that's a component of the SUS that exists. Now we want to have a software update server. So the software update engine in, sorry, yes? Oh, that's not good. Having the the NetSus appliance on the same network segment VLAN subnet as an actual netboot server. Yeah. You'll find that, or I have found that that your netboot image is actually hosted on your on your server app no longer work. That when you go to netboot or it's a disruptive broadcast from the NetSus. Um, very disruptive broadcast from the NetSus. Um, this is actually the, the Python implementation of that. I was cross-referencing it with the boot service discovery protocol from Apple, as well as I got the source code for BSDP and started sifting through all of that to work out how it was assembling everything. This, for all intents and purposes, actually behaves exactly like OS X server. Um, so it plays nice on the same network as an OS X server. All right, next thing, software update. We're going to grab hold of Reposado. This is another thing. We're just going to download it. Well, you can download the zip straight from Git. I think I put the, the thing in there. We just need to create a URL for it. So those of you who want to do this, a simple Reposado config is, well, very simple. Um, just need to unzip it. There's everything there. There's a lot of stuff in there, documentation and things that you need to read. I am just going to move the code itself into a logical location that we can use. Once again, I'm going to clean up as I go because I like being clean. It's a little bit of OCD with me. And now we should have, um, so Web server configuration, I really like the model that Apache uses with includes. So it has an include directory conf configuration files. You just put modular things in there, which makes it really easy to turn things on and off and on the fly. And you can basically just remove your config file temporarily if you want to test something or put something else in in its place. Um, it makes it easy rather than having a single file and having to do a complete service restart, um, which is quite useful. I could have used sed and awk to punch this thing into this file, but I will actually VI it because it's just a scary looking command otherwise. So we've got a simple, um, in fact, I will open it up again and then walk you through this. I'm telling Apache to listen on 8088, which is the default software update port. Um, I'm just mimicking what Apple do here. You can tell it to listen on 80 and drop the port number off your software update URL. I have told it where I'm putting my software update service. I have defined some information about the, directi uh, the directory itself, and I've put a couple of rewrite rules in here so that it detects the version of the OS user agent when software update checks in, and it redirects them back to the default index.su catalog so that we don't have to basically piss around with really, really, really long URLs for getting things. Because when you get down towards the top, the bottom where we've actually got the El Capitan software update service in there as well. Um, it can get a bit ugly. We haven't changed that, so that's all good. Now, I don't even have to bounce Apache, just reload the configuration file. It picks up the additional one I added, and I should be able to, uh, oh, actually, I've got to configure Reposado first. If I don't, we're not going to see anything. Um, the paths I set up before, where we're going to put everything. This is all very well documented. Greg's really good with his documentation, so it makes it nice and easy. And last but not least, I need my server URL. So we're broadcasting from there, it's all good. Um, now, be warned when you do this, you're gonna download 170 gig of stuff and it takes a while. So I'm just gonna kill the process before it gets too carried away. Um, then I'm going to just make a little, Actually, here's a thing I like about Linux servers. Placeholder page. Doesn't matter what URL you go to on this, that if you're trying to get a directory listing, this is all you're going to see. So if you're worried about users browsing your servers and pulling your software and all of that sort of stuff with something I'm gonna do later, this kind of prevents that from happening. You really have to know where everything is here. Um, so just temporarily, I'm gonna actually update the HTTP config for this. 
and reload the service. And then we can see that we should have started to download some stuff. So we've got some catalogs, just partial of one. We've got some downloads that have started already. So this is the, anyone looked at the tree structure in software update server? This is exactly that. I need the Final Cut Pro 5 update, yay. Okay, good. That's another thing. That's useful. Anyone? Questions, comments? Nothing? All right, let's keep going. Yeah, we've got 20 minutes left and a lot to do. Um, I'm going to install SMB services. This is pretty easy. Um, so I like to back up my original system config files if I screw something up so I can go, through, go back to it and check out what I'm doing. I have noticed that in the Samba config that it is um, on the Red Hat baseline or the CentOS baseline, it's always throwing errors in the log and they piss me off. And it took me a long time to figure them out. But it is Unix file extensions, number one. Um, and that's because the OS 10 clients, when they connect to the shares, they do things and it doesn't much like it. Um, the print cap service uh, is always playing badly unless you have a printer installed. Seeing I'm not installing a printer on my you know, file server here, um, I turn that stuff off. And then I have this nice quiet little log that basically doesn't tell me anything and doesn't fill up my hard disk. Um, the other thing I was fooling around with, now by default, all of the Samba configuration is in one file. Um, but it does support includes. So I create a, an additional configurations directory. Um, directory. I'm going to create, create some users, because anyone guess what I'm about to do with all of this? <laughs> yes, no, maybe. All right, we're going to create a couple of users. I'm going to cheat when entering their passwords, because this is a scriptable way of doing things. Because I've installed Samba, I now have to set the SMB password variable as well for the user. Um, because the passwords are hashed differently for SMB and stored in a different location. So you can reset the password from a system layer and the old passwords will still remain in Samba. So when you reset a user password in Samba, you've got to do it twice. I didn't have time to build an AD server so I could join this to AD, but you can do that too um, and just draw all of your users through. It's not a difficult process. If anyone wants to know how to do that, email me. It's like six lines of configuration. Um, I'm going to, sorry? Yeah, yeah, Curb Samba, fully joined to AD, single sign-on. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Once you wrap your head around how to do it and are able to get all of the information you need, but it's, um, I've done that a few times now. All right, um, I am going to create, create an include configuration file. I am going to define a single share, and we're going to get out of there. Turns out I don't need to do those two commands. I do actually need to create all of the directories for the share, which is not a big deal. And tell it who owns it. Users have read-only access. Yes, that's all good. And add my include to the tail end of the standard SMB config file. So now if I need to edit or disable that share, I can just edit the default config file and just wipe the last line off it. Um, I do that a lot when I'm scripting things. Um, just turn on Samba and start it. And if I'm right, we should be able to connect. Be nice to me. Samba's the only one that I ever find gets flaky. Cool, we're done. So that's good. I've got three more to do. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to enable SSL web services, pretty straight up and down. So we just install the SSL extension for Apache. We are going to back up the original SSL config file. We're going to update a couple of things to handle the Moodle vulnerability and a few sorts of other bits and pieces. I'll do them one at a time. It's just ambitious not to. Um, telling it which certificate file to use, so you can edit the config file and point it to a different SSL cert if you want to actually not get warnings and notifications and other things. Um, did I just lose my place? Yeah. No, that's not a good thing to do. A two-liner with all sorts of escapes in it. Um, Steve Heyman would be very proud of my use of regular expressions today. Reload the HTTP service, and I should be able to 
one, three, four, I believe. Show cert, that is my CentOS server. Happy days, and we hit the placeholder again. We're on, so that's good, so we've got HTTPS going. What about if we want to put authentication on it? So we want to have an authenticated publish over HTTPS of our Samba share. So let's do that. Which is a really simple little directive. Now, by the way, pull me up this afternoon. I'll explain how each of these configs work. I'm just pasting them in because we're time short. I just want to show you that everything can actually be done and done really easily. Um, so we've got that. We need to create an HT access file, which is basically the share permission for users. We need to add HT passwords for our users. First time I issued this command, it has a C in it because it creates the file. Every time after that, you drop the C, otherwise you override it, and only the last user you add can access things. That one took me a little while. Now, I should be able to hit this up. Oh, and things we forget to do. We've updated that configuration. We need to reload it. Let's go again. Mm-hmm. Why are you not asking me to authenticate today? Because I haven't quit my browser since I tested this this morning. There we go. And we're in. So you can protect SharePoints and things like that over HTTP fairly easily and simply. So that's good. Um, MySQL. This is an interesting one. I'm going to do this two ways. Uh, one, I wanted to, oh, sorry, I'm going to do it one way, and it's the hard way. I wanted to illustrate the, um, the concept of actually getting a bundled generic tarball down from the net, installing it, carving up the config files, and doing all of the hoops that you have to jump through. And MySQL is a good example for that. The other reason why I chose this is because um, Sometimes, if you're in a very strict Red Hat environment, they won't allow you to add additional repositories, like the Oracle MySQL repositories, so you will have to do this anyway. So it's a nice little reference point, and the MySQL guide sucks, so I just wrote my own. Um, so we need a couple of supporting things. They don't tell you we need them, but we do. Um, so a single library, and we need Perl, because Perl does all of the MySQL configuration scripts. Downloading a tarball means that the users don't automatically exist. I'm fussy about my Unix, uh, sorry, my users on Red Hat. I like to use the actual system groups and create the accounts the way the original packages from the vendor does it. Um, one other thing of note, Red Hat variants, MySQL uh, only goes up to 5.1. whatever, um, and Jamf really recommend that we run MySQL 5.5 or above. Um, so I'm going to do 5.6 because I like unstable things sometimes. Um, so we have to create our group first, then we create our user account. We're done there. I'm going to pull down the MySQL binary, which is a biggie. It's about 300 meg. Oh, yes, 300 meg. Um, I'm going to get rid of the default Red Hat configuration. There is no MySQL installed on it, but the configuration file is in the system by default, so we'll move that out of the way. We'll unpack our tarball into an appropriate location. Um, and we'll do it very verbosely so we can see everything that it's doing. And just about there. We'll clean up after ourselves. We will sim link it into a standard location. So this is interesting. With the tarball install guide from MySQL, they tell you to leave it with this great big huge ugly ass folder name and then sim link it, which has its advantages. When you upgrade it, you just upgrade it. The new version sits side by side. You sim link, you remove the sim link, and you link it to the new version. So you also have a rollback path, which is sort of useful. Um, these are things that you can do with yum without having to do that. So we have to set our user, or like our permissions on MySQL correctly, set the data directory. Now, it's funny with the tarball, um, it doesn't play nicely with the system sockets, so you've got to do a bit of hopping back and forward of setting stuff up. So I'm just going to mod the config to do a couple of things to get it going, and then I'll put it back to the way it should be. Um, I have to create a directory for it to put its stuff in. I have to move all of the system stuff over. I have to set the permissions correctly. 
have to go into because not everything's in my path at the moment and execute some things from a relative location. So we need to create the initial DBs. Um, so if you use the Oracle YUM repository, all of this stuff gets done for you. Um, does not get done for you here. Um, there is also a little thing. Um, so there's a couple of directives that JSS doesn't like very much in the, the config file, and they're in one line, so I just comment that out so it's no longer a problem. Set a startup item in place, add my startup item, start my service. Yay, we're up and going. Secure my MySQL installation. We have no password. Give it a password. Can anyone? Uh, yes. Whatever. OK, we're good. I need to get back to my normal working directory and stop my service, create the socket so we can connect to it correctly via IP. Um, another thing, because the binaries are in a non-standard location, we have to update the, um, the profile path. So I just create a little bash script to do that, make it executable. So etc profile D, things that execute on login. So all it does is updates the path variable. Um, I'm just going to jump off, jump back on. Then we should be able to see that it's mapped and found the path and added the binaries. Useful. Handy little tip. So all of these things can be applied to all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff in the land of Linux. We're going to start MySQL. We're up and going again. Connective to it. OK, so cool. So I did include the process of doing it from the MySQL repositories. You can see that's a lot easier than what I just did then, um, and a lot more predictable. Uh, I found that from version to version, quite often you have to modify that previous process. I am going to create a database for Jamf and grant it access. Now we're getting somewhere. So now I'm going to install a JSS. Uh, JSS has one dependency, Java. So let's get that down there. Java has tons of dependencies, puts crap everywhere. Um, so one thing I, you know, you can take this as feedback, guys. I don't like the Jamf installer for the way it creates the user. It's non-descriptive and it just assigns it a normal user ID. I like it to be a system account. <laughs> this string is very useful. <laughs> um, so I pre-create the user because once the user exists, the Jamf installer doesn't create it. I will grab the Jamf installer. This one I can't give you a download URL for because you have to have um, an asset in your Jamf Nation account if you have a Jamf Nation account. Um, unzip it, run the installer, let it go. It'll ask me some questions. Yes. So in a few seconds. Waiting for Tomcat. We're always waiting for Tomcat. Done. Clean up our installer again. Get rid of it. And I should be able to if it's responding to me. Have a JSS up and going. So last but not least, let's configure the backups. And we now have a backup of our JSS database. We're in the setup assistant. We're all done. Now, obviously, this is untuned and unconfigured and all of that sort of stuff, but you can get everything down there and you can get it really quickly. Um, some things of note. I just installed everything on one box. I never do this, ever. That's a bad idea. Um, Service-specific roles, keep them split up, have them virtualized, all of that sort of stuff. Um, much, much easier and it lightens the load. So there are things that you need to do after you do that, but anyway. Real good. Uh, a couple of other little things of note. If you want to update all of your software, so this is going to be the first time I hit the internet, and it'll take a little while. 
Um, and we won't bother with the last commands, which are just basically cleaning up all of the caches and all the crap I left behind while I was doing my installs from other locations and things like that. And look at that. I'm so glad that I used local installs for everything because this is actually running quite slowly and it means it would have taken me about 90 minutes to do this top to tail with an internet connection. Um, so it's found everything I need. I'm going to tell it to download the lot and we'll see how it goes. This might also all be sitting in a transparent proxy somewhere now because I've done it once this morning. Um, but this is just downloading and updating and getting everything security patched in one go because we like to keep our servers up to date. Um, you can specifically install updates by giving them name. Typically, it's just what's before the version number. It'll update anything that it depends on being updated all for you. Yum is your, your friend unless you're using Puppet and then it's a pain in your ass. Um, because of async processes and all sorts of other fun stuff. Any Puppet users here? Yes, we like Puppet. Um, Puppet is cool for doing Linux servers. You just say, make it so. You put all of this information that I just did into Puppet and it would build it for you. We like things that do that. Okay, um, I'm gonna throw that away for now. So that's all for that. So, that's good. It's reasonably easy to do. You walk through the command line, you know all of the commands, best practices. Um, in case it wasn't self-evident, when you do stuff in Linux, don't just try it and then say, oh, hey, hey, that worked, and then not know how to do it again. Make whatever you do repeatable and predictable. Very, very important. Because if it's not and something breaks, you will spend countless hours trying to work out what the hell you did in the past and fix it. Believe me, I've made this mistake. Um, so it's got to be solid, repeatable, you know, easy to do. All right. um, there was a reason why I put everything into a text file and copied and pasted. It. It's not very far off being a bash script. It wouldn't take much effort to turn that into a bash script. You comment out the VI commands and you just put in some basic straight echoes to build the text files on the fly. Um, so that's kind of cool, and you can change certain parameters into variables and you know, enter your usernames and passwords and everything in a configuration at the start and build it in one go. In fact, I've done that before, and I also got a little bit carried away. Um, so when I was talking about pulling apart the NetSus and seeing how it was working, there were a couple of things I wanted it to do. Um, then I got enthusiastic, and I wanted it to do some more th things, and then I wanted it to be aware of other servers, and then I wanted it to, to do stuff. Um, so I kind of put this together. And if we give it a moment, it'll start up. It should do what the NetSus does and tells me where it is, which is at 245 today. So the NetSus is basically PHP fronting a bash script. So you can tell PHP to call commands in the system. So we build things in PHP to talk to things in the system. Um, I wanted to make mine a bit more specific, so I want it to do certain things. I'm just going to turn on MySQL and start the service and should get prompted to set a root password, which we do. I'm going to install Tomcat. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to install a JSS. <sighs> so we'll just grab the zip file and we'll upload that. This will take a moment or two. Um, I haven't been able to get my head around async PHP, so kicking something to the background and then having a progress bar on the screen. But I'm not really a PHP guy. Um, I've just sort of muddled this together a bit. And I think this process takes about 45 seconds. It's not dissimilar to what I did from the command line before, because all it's doing is extracting the zip file, running the run file, and auto-responding to it in the background. Um, so it should be there in a moment. So it basically installs it the way you would from the command line. That's all I'm doing here. Um, it's complaining because I can't talk to my database, probably because I haven't created it. Um, my service is not running, nothing's going on here. So let's go over here and create a database and we'll create a user for it, um, which are all of the Jamf defaults just hard-coded in there to make it nice and easy. 
So now it's not complaining. We can set our memory parameters. Crisco showed you a couple of things earlier today. Um, I put a web wrapper around them for stuff that you can't see outside of the J um, database utility. Um, and when you don't have a GUI, that's a bit difficult. Um, so let's uh, start up Tomcat. I'll take a moment. And I've got a nice little stall. Come on. I hate when things are slow. Um, so I'll do something else while I'm waiting for that. Um, I will turn on the database utility. Oh, there we go. No. Yes, there we are. Thank you. Um, and we'll just schedule our backups and delete backups all in seven days. Same thing, same schedule. Uh, we'll get a distribution point going. We will use AFP and HTTP. Um, that'll be good. Just test to make sure it's working. No, not working. Hmm. Why not? Because I haven't started it. Yeah, all good. Hey, there we are. So that's good. Um, what else would we like to do? Software update server? Well, we've seen that. That's pretty boring. Um, enable our netboot server. Jump over to here. Upload a netboot image. So I used all of the default passwords and usernames from the, the NetSus as part of this, basically because I didn't want to reinvent the wheel for what I didn't have to. Um, so now this is slightly pimped over and above the NetSus in the sense that I will just throw three NBIs into there and refresh my page. Like I said, haven't got async. Um, so something didn't come through quite right or I refreshed before I'd finished copying or the plist is munged, um, probably in a binary format or it hasn't finished copying yet. Um, <laughs> Anyway, that'll come back. Maybe it'll come back. Or maybe something's crapped itself. Come on, stop it. Nothing like brute force to solve a problem. Nope, I've crashed my finder. Awesomeness. Um, well, other things will still work while that's going on. And given that I have about 90 seconds to go, I think I've done fairly well in covering it all off. Um, and this is why I wanted to basically give away the build script, um, because it's just too hard to do so much in a short space of time without actually covering some useful stuff. I should be able to see my netboot server. Um, so they're the two that did actually copy. But we're done. So that's, that's it. That's what you can do if you, you know, give yourself a couple of weeks, lock yourself in a dark room, have tons of caffeine, and read every best practice guide under the sun, learn a programming language, and front a bash script. That was the result. <laughs> um, do we have any questions? Thank you. <laughs>